Uh, welcome everybody to this pop-up office hour. I was not planning on doing one today, but the weather in California has been uh, not only more active, uh, but also kind of in a, a strange way. This has been a really difficult week uh, to predict California weather. I found myself uh, in LA earlier this week dodging some, some pretty significant downpours in a way that I, I wouldn't call them unexpected entirely, but they, they've honestly been really hard to parse and to predict hour by hour. Uh, so why is that? Why have some places seen a lot less rain than had initially been predicted this week? How might that change over the next 12 to 24 hours and just generally what's going on? Uh, I figured today would be a good day to do a, a radar tour, a satellite tour of California because there is some interesting stuff going on. I've got a bit of time and perhaps the most interesting weather uh, is coinciding with the time we can actually uh, look outside and, and see the, the clouds and the phenomena that I'm talking about, depending on where you are in California. So I thought this would be a nice opportunity uh, to, to do that. One thing I wanted to mention, I'm not quite sure if it made it through at the beginning of the conversation, but there's a new coupon code for my Extreme Weather and Climate Calendar. You can find the details, the code itself, and the link. Uh, at the beginning of the chat, the live chat today, I put something in there myself. So uh, please do take advantage of that. Uh, the publisher um, uh, makes these uh, deals available uh, periodically. I don't always know in advance when they're going to happen. So, But there is one in effect now, and I think through, through uh, I believe, through the 28th. So I think that's all of next week, too. All right, well, so what I really wanted to talk about today was uh, this kind of unusual storm system that has just been kind of sitting off the coast of California, really, for several days now, and is still going to be there for another 24 hours at least before it sort of uh, accelerates and kicks itself out uh, onward to the east. As it does so, it's going to bring more widespread and significant rain uh, later today and into tomorrow morning than I think we've seen so far from the system. Uh, but for those of you who saw my last office hour or read my last blog post, you may recall that originally there was a prediction that most or all of California could see pretty widespread moderate to heavy early season rainfall with some significant Sierra Nevada snowfall. Uh, we're talking in, in the multiple feet down to uh, lake level or below. Uh, now, the storm has been, first of all, greatly delayed. Uh, it's just been spinning out there now for days, and the total amount of precipitation that most places have seen has, have been a lot lower than had been predicted for this point. Uh, I guess we're now on Friday afternoon, although some places have still seen some significant precipitation and even some pretty intense thunderstorm activity so far in Southern California earlier this week, along with some, some rather dramatic uh, clouds. Uh, including uh, uh, some rare Asperitas clouds, which is the new, most recently named cloud type. Those types of clouds, of course, the clouds themselves are not new, but the name for them and the official scientific recognition of those kinds of clouds, you may have seen those images floating around on social media, is only a few years old. Uh, they still aren't fully understood, by the way, uh, but generally are thought to occur uh, un, in, in at least a moderately unstable atmospheres with a significant amount of turbulence, which we certainly had both of those boxes checked earlier this week. Speaking of unstable atmospheres, uh, you may have noticed that the, uh, the temperatures in California right now are pretty unusual for a cool season uh, precipitation event. Uh, we are not in summer anymore. It's mid-November. Thanksgiving is next week. And yet, right now, in parts of the Central Valley, temperatures are in the mid-70s, uh, with some significant humidity. Same uh, is true of most of the California coast, in fact, below about one or 2,000 feet in elevation, even the inland valleys. Uh, temperatures right now are mostly in the 60s and 70s, which is quite warm for this time of year, given that there's a high chance of rainfall uh, within the next few hours in most places. So what is going on? Uh, what happened to the storm? Uh, and, and, you know, what, what does that say about, about weather prediction? I think maybe is a, a fair question, uh, you know, in the, in the bigger picture. So one thing I want to do today, especially now that I do finally have a more stable, uh, somewhat, uh, still tenuous, but more stable internet connection, is share some live uh, animated weather imagery. So as it, momentarily, I'm going to switch over uh, you won't see my face anymore. You're going to see full screen, and I promise it'll be full screen so the visibility is good. 
uh, uh, the, you'll see some full screen uh, satellite imagery first and then I'll pivot later to radar imagery and not totally sure exactly where we'll go because that's going to depend on how things are looking right now. So I'm going to pull up that satellite imagery right now. So bear with me a moment. It'll be just a second before uh, you see this coming on screen. Uh, great. Looks like you're going to see this uh, full screen or, or nearly full screen now. Uh, perfect. So let me just pull up one other thing. What you're viewing, by the way, is real-time uh, visible satellite imagery with uh, some geocolor background. So this is an actual image of the Earth from a geostationary orbiting satellite right now, goes west, uh, showing not only the clouds and, and the surface of the ocean, but also the actual state of the land. So this isn't some reference land map. This is actually what the landscape looks like right now. So you can see which areas um, still have uh, evergreen trees in the west. You can see places uh, that have... Uh, started to lose their leaves for the season. So anyway, this is live imagery. You're seeing the land surface and the atmosphere as it actually appears from space right now. Always cool to be able to do this. Uh, let's see here. All right, so as I do this, uh, I'm going to talk about a few features and you're going to see my, my cursor uh, move around for a bit. Uh, just want to double check one more thing uh, to make sure you're actually seeing. Uh, good. Looks like we're seeing what we're expecting to see. Oh, not anymore though. Now you're seeing uh, <laughs> now you're seeing my, my control panel. Apologies for the back and forth. Still learning uh, the best way to to make this work. Um, okay, back to the, what we're supposed to be seeing here. Full screen, full screen, perfect. So what you can see uh, right now is what is pretty apparent is this broad low pressure system spinning uh, off the coast of California. But as you, you can further see, there are a bunch of satellite low pressure systems. In fact, even within this one, there are a couple of individual uh, sub circulations, sub vortices within the broader low. Um, another one up here. So this whole thing is generally, uh, this whole big area uh, is spinning in cyclonic fashion, as you'd expect a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere to do. Uh, but what's interesting is there are all these other little low pressure systems embedded within the broader one, even though the one that's uh, approaching the San Francisco Bay Area right now from the southwest is the main center of circulation. Another thing that you can see is this pretty distinct curved band of clouds that goes all the way down from well west of the coast of Baja, California, all the way north, uh, wrapping back in toward the center of the low that's approaching the Bay Area and central and northern California as we speak. Also, if you may notice these colored dots, these uh, pink and purple flat, uh, things that are popping up at different points along this band of clouds, those are cloud to ground lightning strikes from the GLM sensor on the satellite. So that's a live view also of lightning activity as it's occurring. As you can see in the most recent frame as the animation ends, and again, this is updating live, so you're about to get a new refresh right now. Um, the lightning is actually a little bit less frequent as, as I speak right now than it was even a couple hours ago. You can see there was quite a bit along this line off the California coast and then also a fair bit of uh, this cluster of storms well to the southwest of California. That may start to pick up again soon. In fact, I, I would be kind of surprised if it didn't because the atmosphere itself right now is actually pretty unstable. Uh, and as folks have reflected, it's quite warm. This is not uh, really a distinct cold front in the same way that, that we're used to, uh, but really this is in fact right now, I think over Northern California, there's arguably a weak warm front where there's actually warmer air moving in from the South and East uh, ahead of this boundary. 
But even this boundary is not really a well-defined cold front. It's sort of being supported uh, by other features, one of which is uh, wind sh a wind shift and convective instability. So the atmosphere uh, to produce showers and thunderstorms, clouds tall enough of producing lightning and downpours, uh, known as deep moist convection is the uh, in, in the biz, the official language. Uh, these sorts of clouds require a certain amount of moisture and instability uh, and also some a lifting mechanism. So in this case, uh, the low pressure system itself and some uh, diverging air at the upper levels of the atmosphere are providing some essentially some dynamic lift. Uh, but the ambient environment is conditionally unstable, which is somewhat unusual for California. The lack of atmospheric instability, in fact, is one of the key reasons why we don't see more lightning in coastal California, why it's kind of rare. Uh, but there is actually, and I'm going to pull up a new tab now, or actually the same tab, but you're going, I'm going to pull up an additional data layer. Uh, you're going to see, I'm actually going to pull up uh, the CAPE layer itself. So this is known as convective available potential energy. And as you can see, this is a little bit clunky because it only updates every few frames. You can kind of see as it goes along. It's a little bit hard to see, but hopefully uh, you can see it on the big screen. There are a few pockets of CAPE that are, uh, and if you can follow with the cursor, up uh, as high as 1,000 joules per kilogram sort of in this region that's approaching the California coast, the central coast and the Bay Area, and then also back down in this region uh, where there's also some lightning occurring to the southwest of California. And while if you were uh, on the Great Plains in spring, a, th a thousand joules per kilogram of, of surface-based cape would be nothing much to write home about in the land of tornadoes and golf ball-sized hail. Uh, in California, that, that's actually quite a large number. Uh, and so this area of instability that's approaching uh, the coast and which is associated uh, with this band of showers and thunderstorms, it has actually been producing quite a bit of lightning over the past few hours. All of this is going to move ashore in the next few hours, probably first uh, in, along the central coast and into the Bay Area. So uh, this is actually a case where, where the central uh, coast will probably see it sooner than Southern California. But eventually this trailing edge down here, there may be more lightning that develops uh, along this whole band as it moves into the, the central coast, Santa Barbara, the transverse ranges, and perhaps the east, far south and east of the LA area as well. So there could be a decent chance of some fairly hefty showers and thunderstorms all the way from the northern San Francisco Bay area down south toward Los Angeles in the coming hours and potentially into tomorrow morning because this band is not the only piece uh, of unstable air here, but as I mentioned, everything that's well offshore is gonna come inland too as this whole feature uh, moves slowly and finally northward and eastward. So this is kind of an interesting storm. It's a very warm blob. It doesn't really have a coherent cold front or uh, really cold air associated with it or incredibly good uh, jet dynamics. But what it does have is a pretty good moisture tap and a decent amount of atmospheric instability. And one other thing I wanted to pull up while I had the map on screen right now, uh, on top of all of this, are the current ocean surface temperature anomalies. Uh, so just how unusually warm is the global ocean right now? There's a bunch of things, as I've been talking about before, the whole global ocean is awfully warm right now. There's a lot more orange and red than there is a dark blue on this map. Uh, you can clearly see El Nino. This is the strong El Nino we keep talking about, not the focus of the conversation today. But what you can also see is that the water now off the coast of California all the way up to the immediate shoreline is actually pretty warm uh, relative to usual. So uh, two to three Celsius or uh, really three to uh, five degrees Fahrenheit or so above average uh, ocean water along the California coast right now. That's significant and it might be providing an added increment of atmospheric instability and moisture to this particular storm. Uh, by the way, if that persists, this could be a signature of storms uh, going into the rest of winter as well. Uh, but for today, I'm, it, it's pretty clear that this, this unusually warm water along the California coast is probably giving a little bit extra juice to the atmosphere, both in terms of uh, increasing the surface-based instability a little bit. You know, a, a thousand joules per kilogram, as we saw on that map, is actually quite high for California standards. 
and also some low-level low boundary layer moisture. Uh, so that's both uh, potentially enhancing the instability in the atmosphere a little bit and also uh, increasing just simply the amount of moisture that's available because this is not a super moist storm uh, without that extra moisture from the ocean, but now that we've got that, there is uh, some, some pretty heavy, hefty uh, uh, downpours occurring uh, where their thunderstorms are now happening. So I'm going to go back uh, into uh, the part where I can see the comments. You're going to see uh, the screen capture go away from it. You're going to see my face again for just a minute or two. There we go. I do have one other thing I want to show, uh, radar, in a minute. Uh, but I want to look at questions uh, first. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why the storm was weird, what we should have lessons about communicating weather and uncertainty about weather predictions. But I'll wait until I have a, a more interesting thing uh, than just my face up on screen. So I'll, I'll bring the live radar up in a few minutes uh, and start talking about that. But I did want to look at the questions that have rolled in so far. Uh, so uh, you may see a, a brief uh, a brief commercial break or something while uh, while I take a sip of water and read the questions that have come in so far. So just bear with me for a moment. All right, so some interesting uh, some interesting comments that I'm seeing so far. Some folks pointing out uh, that it sounds like it's uh, 80 degrees right now in, uh, I think that's Riverside County, uh, inland, uh, 70 degrees in the Kern River Valley at 3,000 feet above sea level. So for perspective, if it's uh, 70 degrees right now at 3,000 feet in effectively the Southern Sierra, uh, it's not snowing except at extraordinarily high elevation. So this is a very warm storm there might be a little bit of snow a little at slightly lower elevations on the back edge later tomorrow, but this is not going to be a big snow accumulator as had been potentially originally um, foreseen. So uh, with warmer and drier weather looking likely next week, I, I don't think we're going to have a, a large snowpack uh, heading into, say, Thanksgiving or the end of November. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are super dry out there. This the storm is going to sweep across most of California overnight tonight and bring pretty widespread rain. So perhaps not a ton of rain, but it will be widespread, and I don't think anybody's going to really be dry, per se, after the next 24 hours. So that's the good news there. Question from Jack Lee about the potential for water spouts. Uh, the... Water spouts are kind of uh, interesting in that a lot of folks think that they are uh, equivalent to tornadoes, and you can have water spouts that are effectively just tornadoes occurring over water. Uh, those can be quite destructive, and they can, can just continue on their path as they move inland. What, most water spouts, though, are a bit different, uh, and they have somewhat different formation mechanisms and generally tend to be a lot weaker and less destructive. They can be hazardous to marine traffic, certainly, and uh, the, if they do make landfall, they can cause uh, some minor damage right along the immediate coast, but generally these are not hugely destructive or deadly events. But uh, they can also form under much more benign, if you will, weather conditions than a true uh, tornadic uh, storm. But tornadoes generally form uh, almost exclusively uh, in thunderstorms, and in particular uh, what are known as supercell thunderstorms. Uh, thunderstorms are already somewhat unusual in California. Supercells are even rarer, though definitely not unheard of, uh, just to be clear. Uh, but water spouts can occur under a wider range of cloud types, uh, sometimes uh, in the Florida Keys, for example, or even over the Great Lakes uh, of North America. You can see this actually this time of year in the, in the late fall. You can get water spouts under uh, just fairly tall run-of-the-mill cumulus clouds. So water spouts are pretty common, actually, in certain tropical uh, and subtropical regions, as well as some war uh, large bodies of water at the end of the warm season uh, under relatively benign clouds. The clouds may not even really be producing much precipitation uh, or lightning, certainly, 
but you can still get water spouts. Water spouts are probably more similar to what are called land spout tornadoes, which are still considered tornadoes, but again, they do tend to be a lot weaker and have different formation mechanisms. So with land spout tornadoes, you generally don't have a fully formed mesocyclone. Uh, you generally don't have the same degree of uh, vertical wind shear that you need for the susten sustaining supercell thunderstorms with water spouts and, and land spout tornadoes. Really all you need is essentially a pre-existing swirl in the atmosphere. And that can come from any number of things. It can come uh, on land, it can come from uh, converging wind boundaries, just like a breeze coming from one direction and intersecting a breeze from another direction, and then that that, that converging uh, the vorticity, that spin uh, at the... If you've ever seen a whirl of leaves on, on, a, on a, uh, a city street with a lot of high-rise buildings, uh, just those, those you know, uh, hardly a destructive weather event, but it gives you a sense of how wind shear at the ground can cause rotation and spin temporarily. A land spout or a water spout is essentially a large-scale version of that, that gets turned into a condensed cloud that can produce stronger wind speeds than your average uh, urban uh, leaf swirl because there is an updraft. So if you're underneath the cumulus cloud, there's upward moving air uh, and due to conservation of momentum, it can kind of stretch that updraft and cause it to spin a bit faster. So really the key is water spouts come from pre-existing vorticity usually in the atmosphere you don't need a super intense supercell thunderstorm. And so you can get them under relatively modest thunderstorm clouds or even just uh, tall cumulus cloud with showers. And we do have those sorts of clouds right now off the coast of California. So I won't be surprised if later this evening, at some point, the Weather Service in the Bay Area or Los Angeles issues what are known as special marine warnings for gusty winds and lightning and the potential for water spouts. Um, that does happen just about every year at, at different times. Uh, this is definitely a favorable pattern for that, potentially from about the San Francisco and Monterey Bay areas southward to right around the, the LA Basin, Channel Island. So definitely a possibility. Not a huge risk unless you're out on a, a small boat, uh, although if you are, I would be more worried about the lightning personally. Uh, also, nothing that's extremely rare, but this storm collectively overall is kind of weird and unusual for the time of year. It's not typical to be seeing showers and thunderstorms with temperatures in the 60s and 70s in mid-November uh, in central and southern California. That is definitely not typical for this time of year, and it is notable. And it is partly because the near shore ocean is now so, uh, so, so much warmer than average that this storm that's just been sitting out there over that warmer than average ocean for the better part of a week has picked up, uh, has, has warmed and picked up additional moisture. So that this probably is at least partly a function of that. All right, so I, now what I'd like to do is bring up uh, the radar and do a bit of a radar tour, see what's going on. Uh, or actually maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, that's, what, that's what I'm gonna do. So you're gonna see my face go away again and hopefully you'll see, uh, oops, not, not quite yet. Uh, you're not quite seeing what I intended here. Uh, hold on a moment. Uh, let's see. Now you're going to see radar scope and this should be it. All right, perfect. Now you're seeing what I'm intending you to see. Uh, full screen. And, uh, okay, good. This, this, this will be showing up. Uh, oh, I see. I need to uh, rescale the screen a bit here just to make sure that everything is as it should be. Apologies. Obviously, I'm uh, I'm still not a a, a video production pro, uh, but uh, it has gotten significantly better. So thanks for bearing with me. All right, uh, now I think you're seeing what I want you to see. All right, so let's see what's going on here. So actually, this is looking quite a bit more active than it was just uh, half an hour ago. Uh, in fact, now there's a band of heavy rain with embedded 
convective cells moving into San Francisco and the Central Bay Area in the North Bay. So if you're in San Francisco, you're about to get some pretty intense downpours and maybe some lightning. Right now, I'm not seeing cloud to ground lightning strikes, but this band is strengthening as it moves northward. Looks like it extends from just west of about, I'm gonna start drawing on my screen uh, as I have in the past, weather channel style. I'm talking about uh, this band of precipitation right here as it's lifting through, and I'm actually gonna zoom in in a moment. Uh, but, uh, and I'll get rid of those so you can see the details. Um, yeah, it's always fun to look at the radar when there's something interesting to talk about. So you can see these individual updrafts, uh, actually, in this case, and you can see uh, where the lightning is most likely to develop. So uh, obviously these, these are known as convective uh, showers, uh, and although there's no, no cloud to ground lightning showing up yet, it might be imminent, you can kind of see where these individual cells are moving through. So there's, of course, this broad brand, uh, band of precipitation that's lifting from essentially from south to north, and it's more intense on its western side as it's sweeping across the San Francisco Peninsula, although it looks like now there's some uh, more intense activity developing in the East Bay, too. It's going to sweep through the North San Francisco and the North Bay shortly. But within it, you can see individual, and this is why we call them cells, uh, let's just uh, track a couple of them. Uh, sort of offshore here, and these are sort of uh, going to be uh, circles that are drawn based on the last frame. And you can see these are sort of where there might be individual torrential downpours embedded in here. These are probably where the clouds are tallest. Uh, the, the, the cloud tops are probably reaching higher into the troposphere, uh, and therefore those are the places where you're most likely to see lightning because you need enough charge separation in the cloud to cause lightning. It's the pockets of taller clouds within this broader precipitation band uh, where those lightning strikes are most likely to form. So if there is lightning imminently, now there's a bunch of these little cells. You can see these. These are getting, the reflectivity is getting pretty high. So far, that means there's probably some quite heavy downpours and maybe even a little bit of small hail embedded in here. But it also means those red dots are essentially where you're most likely to see uh, lightning develop. And as they move over the ocean, that is where you'd be most likely to see, uh, say, a water spat or two. Uh, so this band has intensified quite a bit, actually, since the start of this live session. And some folks in the Bay Area are probably already experiencing some rather heavy rainfall, maybe hearing some thunder. Uh, let's just pull up, uh, just to be really fun and geeky, let's pull up, uh, let's see here, what I want. So yeah, this, 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 uh, so this is a, a velocity product that's going to tell us the motion of the air within this precipitation band. And if there were any convective cells that were likely imminently going to produce a water spout or something, you'd probably see what are known as couplets. So areas uh, of essentially where the red and the green alternate uh, very quickly associated with high uh, reflectivity. So uh, I'm not really seeing anything like that right now, which is consistent with the fact there's no uh, marine warnings out from the Weather Service. So I'll put that away since it's actually not that interesting right now. Uh, but this certainly is, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to look at as this wave lifts into the Bay Area. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit, see what's coming up from the south. One uh, thing to note is that this band right now is clearly uh, most intense from about, as I mentioned, the, the 580 corridor in the eastern uh, Bay Area westward. And so sort of this portion of it as it lifts nor northward through really the most heavily populated parts of the Bay Area, including San Francisco, uh, heavy rain and possible thunderstorms imminently. Uh, if it's not happening already, it's likely to happen within the next 30 to 60 minutes, and that's gonna be true as this lifts into the North Bay. Uh, but also, if you look to the south, there's plenty of other activity uh, going on. In fact, uh, there's a broad region of showers that have the potential to become thunderstorms just lifting up through the Bay Area. So these are gonna to continue to stream northward through the evening I would expect the lightning to pick up again since it actually looks like all of this is intensifying again rather than weakening. So again, uh, probably going to see some lightning uh, in there too. 
Right now, not seeing as much activity in the Central Valley, although there's a nice blob of rain uh, near out by Merced. Uh, not a ton of rain, no lightning with that right now. Uh, it's sunny and warm right now, uh, as folks have noted, uh, in the southern Sacramento Valley. Uh, but that will likely change uh, shortly as this whole wave of precipitation continues to lift northward. And because it's so warm, there is a fair bit of instability in the lower layers of the atmosphere. I wouldn't be surprised if some additional showers or thunderstorms popped up in this area too over the next few hours. So uh, this, and you can see if you really zoom out, uh, this is going sort of at the edge of what the radar at Mount Uminum in the Santa Cruz Mountains can see. Uh, but it looks like there is potentially that the center of the low, uh, the broader low pressure system of the Pacific is somewhere out here. You can kind of see that rotation. So all of this stuff is sort of occurring in the warm sector uh, ahead of this low pressure system. Again, there's not much of a cold front. Uh, but until this back edge moves through back here, there's going to be a lot of shower and thunderstorm activity from the central coast up to the Bay Area uh, through the evening and potentially into tomorrow. Take a bit of a radar tour. Let's go to the next southernmost radar in California, which is at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base on the central coast. Put that into motion. And you can see something similar. Uh, there's, there's this, and it's a little bit hard to see. There's some lightning. There was some lightning up here. Um, more rain starting to move into the central coast. And there again, it's sort of this line. You can see this back edge. It's along this line that the lightning would be, uh, thunderstorms would be most likely to develop. And all of that's going to sweep eastward uh, in the coming hours. And so later this evening, the coastline. Uh, really from about the, the central coast southeastward toward about Orange or Los Angeles counties. They're probably going to see some hefty shower and thunderstorm activity, maybe some stronger storms with some, uh, sm with some smaller hail and some stronger winds, perhaps a water spot offshore, and maybe some localized flash flooding because convective downpours are always tricky if they hit the wrong place at the wrong time. It doesn't take a big storm for uh, a very heavy rain cell to hit a particular flood susceptible canyon or recent burn area and cause a significant problem. So not quite as interesting a radar yet in Southern California, but I would expect this radar screen to light up even more overnight. Go back to the Bay Area since it's pretty active right now and I'm just sort of waiting, expecting to see some lightning show up soon. You can see like some of these, some of these individual cells just west of San Francisco right now are looking pretty hefty. Um, about to get quite a bit of rain up in Marin. Um, but yes, I mean, again, still not seeing uh, cloud to ground lightning strikes on this map, but I would not be surprised if you're hearing some thunder from in cloud lightning uh, and uh, would not be surprised to see some strikes developing shortly because this band does look like it's intensifying as it moves in. All right, I'm going to go back to the screen where I can actually see people's questions. Uh, so I'm going to turn off the device capture. You're going to see my face again, um, whether or not that's a good thing. Um, looking at the questions here, uh, and then what I might do is, uh, if there aren't a lot of questions, um, I might uh, I'll bring the radar back up and talk a little bit more about the uh, the, the weather uh, prediction yet. Uh, let's see here. So from some folks commenting that the rain uh, is is just starting or they haven't had haven't had the rain yet. Folks stating that the Santa Cruz Mountains have not seen downpours yet. Uh, that's entirely consistent with what the radar is showing right now. It's showing that there are huge downpours to the north of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they did not they were not there when that band moved over the Santa Cruz Mountains. It would have been light showers or sprinkles. They've, it's really intensified as it's moved northward over the Bay Area right now. A uh, question from Michael, uh, so to be clear, this is not an atmospheric river anymore like forecasters were saying a week ago. I also have the term cutoff low. Is that a more accurate term for this? Yes, this is a cutoff low, although that was in the forecast the whole time. If you read my blog post from last week, you'll see the, the term cutoff low mentioned. Cutoff low and atmospheric river, by the way, are not mutually exclusive terms. Uh, an atmospheric river can, can occur with or without a parent low pressure system. 
when they occur without a parent low pressure system, uh, they're usually just kind of blobs of moisture. Uh, they're uh, not really going to produce a great deal of uh, storm impacts or precipitation. You might get light precipitation, but you need some mechanism to generate that upward vertical motion in the atmosphere to produce rainfall. So if a strong atmospheric river comes attached to a strong low pressure system, uh, then we're talking because that's, uh, that's, that's a combination of a very moist atmosphere and also the atmospheric lift, the upward vertical motion that you need to generate clouds and condensation and ultimately precipitation. So we have a, a not very strong low pressure system right now. It's, it's a pretty run of the mill cutoff low, but as I mentioned, it's been sitting for a number of days over unusually warm ocean water. Uh, and it has been uh, sort of just spinning there and gathering moisture and becoming uh, more and more unstable over time. And by unstable, again, I mean in the vertical dimension, the atmospheric temperature and humidity profile is becoming increasingly favorable for things like showers and thunderstorms, tall cumulus clouds that can produce heavy showers and sometimes lightning. Uh, in terms of the atmospheric river, uh, you know, probably by some automatic monitoring tools, uh, parts of California have been experiencing weak uh, atmospheric river con conditions on and off all week. An atmospheric river is not really that exciting, as I mentioned, unless it comes attached to a dynamic storm system and is particularly strong. Weak atmospheric rivers are mainly just going to produce clouds and maybe some light precipitation if you're lucky. And parts of California have seen that this week. I think the term atmospheric river is sometimes overused, um, even though it officially meets certain formal algorithmic definitions. I probably wouldn't really use the term atmospheric river to describe what's going on this week, not because you can't make a quantitative definition that might encompass it, because it, it, it's, it's a tricky to communicate, you know, atmospheric river to a lot of folks in California connotes major storm with major impacts. Uh, that, you know, that may or may not be appropriate because you can have major storms without an atmospheric river that produce major impacts in California, and you can also have uh, atmospheric rivers that do not produce much of anything in terms of impacts. So it's very context dependent. Just because there is or isn't an atmospheric river doesn't really tell us that much about what's actually going to happen on the ground. It's the, the other bits of context, meteorologically speaking, that are important. Uh, so at times, California has experienced weak atmospheric river conditions this week, but I don't think that's the interesting part of what's going on. We get you know, dozens of days with weak atmospheric river conditions somewhere along the west coast of California uh, in a typical year. The interesting piece right now is that there is this cutoff flow. It's been kind of lingering over unusually warm water, and it is kind of unstable. It's producing thunderstorms and downpours and rain amid a really warm air mass. People, again, are commenting uh, here in the chat that the temperature outside is anywhere from 65 to 80 degrees outside. That's not normal for mid-November by, by any stretch of the imagination. So for me, it is the thunderstorms and the warm conditions coinciding with potentially significant precipitation in some places that is the most interesting. Um, atmospheric river, debatable, certainly not a strong one. I don't even think a moderate one, but probably, yes, a weak one at times as this sort of warm subtropical flow vaguely uh, makes its way up uh, over California. But... Um, to me, that's not the term I would use to describe the most interesting aspect of what's going on this week or the most, uh, the, the piece of it that's most likely to have significant impacts, which would be the, these heavier downpours and thunderstorms that may occur later today into tonight and potentially into tomorrow in some spots. A question uh, from Jack about whether the radar I was just using is available to the public. Well, the underlying data all comes from the National Weather Service, by the way, who unfortunately does not have a good data visualization uh, portal for reasons that are uh, politically very interesting. The Weather Service, by the way, has been prevented from legally uh, making its own data visualizations uh, widely accessible and high quality because there is the perceived uh, uh, private sector uh, competition problem and there's been a lot of lobbying in Congress to prevent the Weather Service from having the expertise and the funding uh, to say develop their own weather app or have really high quality visualizations. This has been something that's been pretty actively prevented over the years. You can look into it. Adam Conover, by the way, had an interesting uh, piece uh, or segment on this 
uh, I think both on his, uh, we spoke together on, uh, on his Factually podcast uh, twice, we mentioned this both times, but also uh, in, uh, on, on some of his uh, television programs has spoken about this very issue, uh, which is uh, something that is a, a bit of a pet peeve of mine, this, this, this sort of absurd reality uh, that we're, we're not allowed to make better public visualizations. But uh, aside from that editorializing, in terms of the data itself, you can go on to weather.gov and view it, uh, although you won't see that exact presentation. That app is called Radar Scope, uh, and it is something you can download. It's not free. The data visualization does cost money, but it's also not that expensive. I think you can get access to the basic version of it for about 10 bucks, 12 bucks a year. Uh, so I personally, it's the only weather app I have on my phone. Maybe I should ask Radarscope if they want to sponsor this thread. But uh, anyway, uh, I like Radarscope, and that's what that app is you're seeing on screen. Um, let's see. There's a question from Ferg uh, about uh, the new uh, Google DeepMind uh, artificial intelligence-based weather model called GraphCast. I'm going to wait uh, to talk about that because I actually want to organize a whole session uh, to talk about AI and machine learning and weather and climate prediction. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. Uh, it is interesting, um, and I think that there's both a lot of promise in it, but also a lot of uh, claims that are still uh, overblown, or at least validation metrics that are being used that aren't necessarily telling us from a, from a savvy meteorology perspective quite what they're purported to be yet. So that's not me saying that I don't think this is a big deal. I don't think this is potentially going to drastically alter the future of meteorology and atmospheric science and climate science. But I, I'm saying that I think we should be cautious in uh, interpreting exactly what we're seeing in this moment. So I think that is definitely fodder for a, a dedicated conversation coming up soon. Uh, let me see here what else is going on in the comment section. A question from Craig, any thoughts on the, uh, the follow-up cold front that's going to ride down the uh, north, northwest California coast late Saturday uh, following kind of really what it's going to do is it's going to help the cutoff low to lift. That's what's finally going to drag it out of the eastern Pacific and uh, shoot it eastward over the western U.S. and bring drier and warmer weather to California. Um, there, yes, there is a cold front, and it, it's part of the phasing of this this uh, phasing p h a s i n g of this uh, this cold front and this this weak cold front and this warm and unstable cutoff lows. Partly, what's going to cause the relatively active weather overnight into tomorrow, uh, as I mentioned, there will probably be somewhat lower snow levels on the back side of this. So at least you know seven eight thousand feet, there will likely be snow tomorrow, maybe briefly below that. Although I don't think there's going to be major snow accumulations much below 7,000 feet or so. I, locally, I could be wrong, but generally speaking, not a super cold or huge storm. But I think that cutoff uh, low, it, it's that cold front that's really going to bring about the, this, the, the movement, finally, of this low pressure system uh, that has not wanted to move on all week because there's really been no steering flow. That is why we call them cutoff lows, by the way, because they are cut off from the jet stream from the typical uh, winds that drive and move storms along in the atmosphere. Um, let's see here. A question from Daniel about whether this, and, and there's an earlier question from someone in Fresno as well, is so whether this activity will make it inland. Uh, perhaps not the thunderstorms, but I, I do think there's going to be some rain uh, overnight in throughout the Central Valley. So this really is going to produce a fairly Brief but widespread period, I think, of rain across most of California, all the way from uh, from the about the Oregon border, all, almost down to the Mexican border, uh, overnight into tomorrow. So everyone's probably going to see some precipitation, even if not everyone sees the heavier downpours and and, uh, and thunderstorms. All right, um, I'm going to bring some imagery back up on screen. So bear with me with that transition again. Uh, okay, so what you're going to see now is, I believe, the radar first. So let's take a look. I'm just taking a look here. Uh, 
All right. Um, yep, so that nice uh, solid band of pretty heavy rain is now moving all the way from about Berkeley into San Francisco on that end of the north, in the, in the North Bay. Um, it's weaker, but it looks like it's starting to fill in uh, south in the in the Central Valley as this this part south of Sacramento starts to to fill in a bit. So let's see. I'm not seeing any cloud to ground lightning detections at the moment here, but um, again, would not be surprised to see those pop up at any point uh, moving forward. Go back to Vandenberg, see what it looks like. Again, it's still a little bit too far north, so I'll go back to San Francisco. Let's go back and take a look at the satellite, actually. Uh, let's see here. So you're going to see Coral Reef Watch. All right. Uh, just looking at the satellite, I'm going to remove that cape uh, background because I don't think we need it anymore. Just look, and maybe I will zoom in uh, on the Bay Area. Uh, here's that swirl, uh, still seeing a significant amount of, um, oops, you're not seeing the satellite. Let me, got to change screens here, uh, then you should see it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, still seeing uh, that nice swirl with all these convective clouds uh, throughout the uh, the, the region on the east side of the low. Again, that's the center of circulation that you're seeing down here in the lower left. Uh, and then this is that arc of clouds and heavier precipitation that's moving up through the Bay Area right now. Yeah, this product also is showing a decrease in lightning recently, so those are consistent with each other. Could pick up at any time, but it certainly looks like the, 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 the cloud tops are cooling and that there's potentially more rain uh, intensifying. So continue to think there's a pretty good chance of thunderstorms from about the Bay Area southward toward LA overnight. Um, certainly saw some interesting ones uh, last night that, that made some noise in San Francisco uh, up, up on the North Bay too. Um, one more thing, maybe I'll look at a different part of the radar, uh, the different part of the satellite, excuse me. Uh, I want to zoom out again because sometimes it's easier to see the chaotic motions. I always think this is kind of cool. This is a mid-level water vapor imagery and you can just see this broad, uh, you can just sort of see this broad low pressure system uh, as it spins and you can see the lightning flashes that have died out a little bit but will probably return. Uh, and it's just interesting to see, you know, you can see the primary axis of rotation but you can see these sub swirls. There's, I can count at least one, two, three, and there's even maybe a couple more embedded in here, but those are the main ones. So they're all swirling in this broader gyre. You can kind of see it outlined with the slightly drier air uh, in this water vapor imagery uh, in, marked in the yellow. And you can see uh, that this line of convective cloudiness is actually a little more apparent, uh, all stretching all the way down off the coast of Southern California. So that's the line that might produce heavier downpours and lightning later this evening. Uh, again, there is still uh, still a sort of a gap in the lightning right now, but that may well change in the coming hour or so. Uh, pretty interesting radar presentation. And before I close, uh, what I might do is go back to the radar here uh, and see see what we see. Um, Bear with me for a moment while I switch over once again. I gotta, um, gotta do this a little bit manually here. All right, and you'll see the the radar uh, in these parting frames. Uh, let me just briefly, uh, and I think I can return actually to the comments while you see the radar. I think that'll stay up on screen as I go. Yes, good, good it is. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, 
the questions have been slowed down a little bit. So what I, you know, what I, what I'll say now, uh, in in the last few minutes, then is talk a little bit about the the prediction from last week. This was one of those frustrating uh, predictions, certainly, and most parts of California may end up getting pretty close to their originally predicted totals, at least along the coast. Now, inland Central Valley and Sierra, I think it's going to end up being significantly drier than the outlook was last week. One of the reasons is this storm, instead of strengthening near the coast because of a favorable jet stream configuration, end up just kind of strengthening way offshore and then weakening, uh, filling low pressure would be the formal term for what happened. And that's not conducive uh, to uh, very uh, stormy conditions. You need a strengthening low pressure rather than a weakening low pressure. One of the, this, this storm is actually punching a bit above its weight at this point because of the unusually unstable atmosphere that is producing and going to produce in the overnight hours more downpours and maybe some lightning too. Um, the, 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 the interesting part about last week is uh, there, there was some uh, buzz over what, what had the potential to be a pretty significant storm, uh, but there was, you know, as always, considerable uncertainty. And there was a lot of folks who had focused uh, excitedly on the individual uh, operational weather model runs. And by that, uh, really what is important to understand is that every six hours, all of the major numerical weather prediction models in the world are updated uh, to predict the weather forward in time based on newly ingested data, which really just means better, newer representations of the state of the atmosphere uh, at, uh, uh, at, at the, the moment that these predictions are initialized. And by initialized, I mean the moment you push go on this gigantic software package uh, that, in, in, that, that knows all the rules of, of physics and chemistry in the atmosphere, well, you know, it's the old garbage in, garbage out kind of argument. Uh, no model's perfect, but no model can possibly do a good job predicting the future if the initial uh, input conditions are bad. Uh, so what you need are the best, most reliable initial conditions possible. Uh, it, and that's updated every six hours from any number of sources, satellites, uh, radar, um, weather balloons, uh, of course, surface weather observations are important too. We don't have those everywhere. All of these things go into these update cycles for the model, but the model isn't just run once. So it's not just push go and the model produces one specific prediction for the next seven to 14 days. No, the model is run dozens of times every uh, six hours. And oftentimes folks uh, focus, and I see this, you know, even sometimes with professional meteorologists, focus on just one member of those dozens. And the problem with that is the reason why those dozens of individual model members run every six hours uh, can be relatively different from each other is because there is some uncertainty in the initial state of the atmosphere. So the whole idea of running the same model dozens of times uh, at the starting forward from the same moment to predict the weather on the same time horizon is to sample that initial condition uncertainty. So to say, we don't know exactly what the world looks like at the first time step or the zeroth time step uh, in the lingo, but we can artificially generate a plume of predictions that approximates what might come from different reasonable ingestions of data to begin with. So in other words, if we don't know exactly what the world is like right now, let's uh, create dozens of plausible representations of those initial conditions, and let's run a forecast for all of them. And generally speaking, uh, each of those, when you go out beyond about two or three days in the future, each of those is equally likely to be correct. Uh, one to two days out, there's often what's known as a control run, which might be a little bit more reliable simply because it's usually run at higher spatial resolution. So you do get a little bit uh, of benefit from that. But generally speaking, more than a couple days in the future, my view as somebody who thinks a lot about ensemble modeling in the climate model world is that Essentially, each of those individual model realizations is about equally likely to occur as any other. And so sometimes when folks focus on the individual ones, it seems like they bounce around a lot uh, from 
uh, every six hours. Uh, by the way, as I've said before, this is the main reason why your weather app seems so bad. It's because most of them just use this single model run that changes a lot every six hours rather than looking at the full ensemble plume or the distribution that does not usually change nearly uh, so uh, stochastically from a six hour update cycle to six hour update cycle. So all of this is to say last week, the ensemble average did suggest the potential for a pretty decent storm, but not as big a one as the individual operational runs had suggested. And so in my blog post, you'll see from over a week ago that I emphasized those ensemble averages. Now, in this case, even the ensemble didn't do a great job relative to what actually ended up unfolding. The timing was way off. The warmth of the storm was greatly underestimated. But that was, this was because this was a pretty complex situation where there was going to be a low pressure system right off the coast, either rapidly strengthening or rapidly weakening. And initially it looked like we might get on the strengthening side, but instead we ended up uh, essentially on the weakening side. And so we didn't get that intensifying storm. We're not getting the big wind storm. We're not getting the widespread kind of rainstorm, although we are still getting a fair bit of rain and that rain is going to pick up as the storm moves inland overnight and phases uh, ejects northeastward as it gets picked up by that cold front that Craig mentioned earlier in the conversation. So from a modeling perspective, uh, this was an example of a storm that was really hard to forecast. Cutoff lows, by the way, are notoriously difficult to forecast. Uh, because they are, as you might expect from the name, cut off from the mean flow. Uh, imagine trying to predict the trajectory of a leaf that falls in a fast-moving stream. Uh, if you are trying to predict whether that leaf is going to move downstream or not in the next minute or so, it's pretty easy to do uh, if you have a fairly rapid linear flow of water in a direction that you can discern. Uh, but if you're in a bit of a backwater, and I mean that uh, literally uh, in the in the fluid ge geomorphology sense, and the flow of the river or stream is meandering and weak, can you predict exactly where that leaf is going to be a minute from now? Or might it be caught in a meander and, and uh, uh, head closer to shore? Might it even flow a little bit upstream in an eddy in the channel? All of those are possibilities. Uh, and this is a good analogy for why when we have a cutoff low, it's really difficult to predict because they kind of just tend to meander around and wander. And uh, in this case, the jet stream wasn't favorable for strengthening and ended up being weaker. And so it allowed this low to meander. So this was a tricky situation to predict. Uh, in the end, it is still raining in most of California or will shortly. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, you know, uh, you, you might still get a big part of what we had expected, minus a lot of the snow, by the way, in the mountains and some of the rain in the inland areas. But along the coast, we may end up somewhat close to what would have been originally predicted. Even though the timing was way off, uh, the temperatures were way off, and the type of storm, frankly, was uh, not predicted very well. This is like a warm, advection, unstable, thunderstormy atmosphere rather than a cold, well-defined dynamic cold front kind of passage. So qualitatively different. I mean, the clouds and the rain are literally moving in the different direction than you might expect from that storm. So interesting object lesson in interpreting predictions, interpreting uh, your smartphone weather app, uh, not latching on to the uh, individual control runs for models, but really encouraging folks, especially more than a day or two in the future, thinking about those full ensemble averages, uh, thinking about uh, those uh, the, the full distribution of possible outcomes. And that's going to be very important in a winter uh, that may have some surprises in store with a very strong El Nino event, but and yet combined with a novel combination of ocean conditions that we have never seen before in recorded history, uh, along with record warm oceans outside of that El Nino zone, as I've talked about earlier. So uh, with all of this, uh, I'm coming close to a close, but I want to take one more look at the radar since I'm actually not looking at it as I'm speaking right now. You'll still continue to see it. Uh, looks like that really heavy band of rain is moving through the central Bay Area right now. In fact, portions of Marin County are probably getting even a torrential downpour right now, right by Mount Tam. 
uh, probably going to be a bit of a mess of a commute from San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, Richmond, and into the North Bay. Uh, whereas in the South Bay, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, it is, it's either barely raining or not raining at all right now. But that too may change shortly as these heavier showers uh, move in from the south and potentially turn into thunderstorms. Uh, whether or not they turn into thunderstorms, it definitely looks like there are heavier showers out there getting ready to move inland. Uh, so I think with that, uh, I've probably, uh, I'll probably uh, close this session. If something crazy happens, maybe I'll jump back on. Uh, I'll jump back on. Uh, but I'm not necessarily anticipating anything crazy to happen. There will be some heavy showers and maybe some embedded thunderstorms and maybe some interesting and unusual weather that will come from those. Uh, hopefully nothing uh, too crazy. Uh, but I suppose in this kind of environment, one never knows, and um, it is fairly easy for me to hop on with the radar at some point if something interesting does happen. We'll point out that, as I mentioned earlier, this, as this whole band of rainfall moves northward, the eastern half of it is starting to fill in and intensify a bit, so that will probably bring rain to the unusually warm uh, southern Sacramento Valley over the next hour or so as it lifts northward. And it's already pouring uh, in, in Richmond and Berkeley and San Francisco uh, and up into San Rafael in the North Bay. Uh, whoops, that was an extra line I didn't need. Um, all right, everybody. Well, I'm going to uh, show my face once more briefly uh, before I head out uh, for the evening. But thanks for joining me. This was a pretty engaged audience. It's interesting that some of these live radar and satellite tours tend to uh, generate a lot of interest, a lot more viewership than some of the other kinds of conversations. So I'll have to keep that in mind. Um, uh, I, I, as I think I've at least figured out uh, how to get radar, the radar up on the screen efficiently and in a way that everyone can actually see. Uh, so that is good and I suspect it will not be the last time I use that modality this winter. Um, as I mentioned, it, it, could be, uh, it could be, certainly has the potential to be an interesting winter. Uh, in closing, I'll just re remind folks uh, once again that there is that coupon code uh, for my Extreme Weather and Climate Calendar. If you scroll up to the top of the live chat, you'll see a link and uh, the actual coupon itself. Uh, but beyond that, uh, thanks everybody for your, your ongoing uh, support and attention and interest uh, and for making these live stream office hours successful. I, I increasingly think this is a, a really valuable use of of my time, uh, and I hope that other folks uh, feel the same way. I, I can only assume that they do, given that the viewership has been continues to increase. Uh, but moving forward, I, I, I do, uh, as I work out the technical glitches, um, I do think this is a really nice mode of interaction moving forward, uh, and an efficient one at that. So with that, I think I'll close. Thanks everybody for joining, and.